Good morning. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. We weren't kidding when we said a quick turnover, so come on in and grab a seat if you're just arriving. My name is Jen Scott Mobley. I'm the VP for conference planning this year. Uh, and I'd just like to quickly say uh, a, a shout out to HowlRound. Thank you so much for the collaboration with us to have our live podcast uh, shooting out on their platform and archive there. And uh, speaking of Lorraine Hansberry and young people doing transformative work, I'm honored to introduce the daughters of Lorraine, Jordan Ely and Leticia Ridley, who will have a very special interview with our special guest, Dominique Mariso. Thank you all. Is this thing on? No, it's on. Um, hi, uh, welcome to Daughters of Lorraine, our live podcast. <laughs> thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, thank you to the Association for Theater and Higher Education, all the conference planning committee. Um, thank you to HowlRound, who obviously Leticia and I love because yeah. <laughs> you support our podcast. Um, and to everyone who may be on the live stream, hello. Um, this is our first live episode. Um, it is so fitting that we're doing it here at the Association for Theater and Higher Education. We have been so supported by the theater community um, since the inception of this podcast in 2019. Cannot believe we've been doing this for three years. Um, and this is so, so exciting. Um, so, welcome to Daughters of Lorraine. We're your hosts. Jordan Ely and Leticia Ridley, <laughs> your friendly neighborhood black feminist. Um, <laughs> um, so we're coming to you live in Detroit, Michigan. Um, we are so, we're excited for every episode, but we're especially excited for this episode and a conversation with Dominique Mariso. Um, please, please refer to your um, programs for a list of her amazing accomplishments, including the MacArthur Genius Grant, um, Tony Award nominations, um, and, and Broadway debuts abound, so please refer to that. Um, before we begin our conversation, uh, we would like to take a moment of silence for um, a, a black theater elder who has recently transitioned, um, Mary Alice. If you are not familiar with her work, um, you might be most familiar with her role um, in A Different World, um, and she's also received Emmy Award for her work in television. Um, so please join us in taking a mo moment of silence to honor her life and her legacy. Thank you, thank you so much for that. Um, so now we're going to transition into our conversation. Um, so, Leticia, would you like to, to kick us off with our first question? Yes, definitely. <laughs> One, let me just say it's an honor to be in the building with you. A uh, wow. huge fan, love of your work, um, and just also just the wisdom that you be spitting in your multiple interviews. I'd be like, oh, got to quote that, got to quote that. <laughs> yeah. um, so just thank you for joining, joining yeah. us, um, and we're so glad that you could be here with us today. Absolutely. Thank so we're going to start with a softball question. Uh, the softball question. <laughs> <laughs> is what got you into theater and why did you choose theater as sort of the storytelling storytelling mechanism that you just decided to work within uh you know I don't know that like I chose theater <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like theater chose me um I grew up you know performing and dancing since I was a kid it, it chose me a long time ago I think the first live performance I remember seeing was uh, Stephanie Mills in The Wiz so I just aged myself <laughs> but, um, but it was here in Detroit and my mother is one of those mothers um, she's a teacher educator she just mm -hmm. let me took me to everything she wanted me to just be stimulated by all the things so I went to see a lot of plays and I think that just experiencing live performance I did then I also had teachers we saw I saw 
plays in school, you know, for school productions, and I want to be up on that stage, you know. So I got up on that stage, you know, in school. Um, and I grew up dancing. My aunt, Carol Mariso, uh, founded Detroit Dance Center. So I grew up dancing in her dance school uh, all my life. And I think that it just, that's why I say it chose me. I think mm -hmm. I just, the bug of performing came from within, from the family influence. And, uh, and, and then, funny enough, I know this is, all, this, is, this is not aged well, this thing I'm about to say, but uh, <laughs> I grew up watching the Cosby Show, and, uh, Fair enough. And, oh. I, and, I, and I always <laughs> wanted to be one of Rudy's friends on the Cosby Show. I, just, I felt like that was my calling that got missed, you know what I mean? <laughs> but I'm not so sure anymore, so. Um, but, but, you know, that was, I just, seeing, seeing reflections of me made me want to get in it. Um, I, I love that you um, talk about how much other people have shaped the way you um, um, approach your work. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of those people is Pearl Clay. Mm -hmm. um, and you wrote this wonderful dedication to her in Paradise Blue, which I, I want to read a little bit of, where you say, for Pearl Clay, because of her inspiration to me as a writer, because of her love of black women in her work, because of her love of Detroit, and because of her essay, Mad at Miles, which gave me the ammunition and bravery to deal with community accountability in and out of my art. Um, so this entire conference, the theme is around um, rehearsing the possible, um, the practice of reparative re cre creativity, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a theoretical concept by Suin Kondo, um, where she identifies it as a strategy by artists of color to, um, to use theater and performance as a mode of repair. Um, and when we think of repair, we think of, okay, this is how we create spaces of care, or this is how we um, make sure that marginalized theater artists feel safe in a space. Mm -hmm. But also that other piece is accountability, which you, you talk about. Um, and so I'd love to hear about how you stage um, community accountability in your work, um, and, and how you also see um, the role of accountability in something like repair work? You know, uh, it's funny. I mean, when you talk about community accountability, mm -hmm. I think Paradise Blue is often a play that can mystify people if they don't understand mm -hmm. that part of it, which is to say that um, I, Pearl Clegg is actually someone who I um, bow down to and, mm -hmm. you know, to her, literal to her feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, she's, a, she's yes. an elder that uh, is an elder in the truest sense of that word of like just ministering and also um, guiding and being so generous to the generations that come after her. Yep. Mm -hmm. I can't speak on that highly enough. But, uh, and her work taught me to both love myself as a black woman and to have empathy mm -hmm. for myself and for others. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when I read Matted Miles, which was her essay, and I had the same question she had for Miles Davis, I had for like my entire hip hop generation. <laughs> and, I, um, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I also had it for, uh, for Miles and for the generation that came before us and the one that's coming after us. And so when I wrote Paradise Blue, I was thinking about um, Miles and I was thinking about uh, what we, how, how do we hold people accountable that we also love? Uh, is there a way to both love and say no more? Mm. And, um, and I think people get really confused with if you critique or if you say hell no, that that somehow is void of love for people. Mm -hmm. And so that we can't, we don't know how to do, we don't know how to hold both in our hands together, you know? And uh, Paradise Blue was a practice for me in holding both in my hands and, and literally taking someone out if you're on a play. <laughs> like, can you take someone out with love? <laughs> but take them out or, or, take the, or take the action out. Like what does that look like? You know, so anyway, she, uh, her work and her interrogation of how do you separate, how can we separate the artists and their art, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and why would we want to was really powerful for me. It made me want to be the artist. When you read my work, you'll, you will know me. Mm. 
you will know who I am. Yeah, we definitely know who you are. And yeah. I love that you just <laughs> hold, like that community accountability piece is across so many of your plays. Mm -hmm. um, recently, Jordan and I had the chance to see Ain't Too Proud mm -hmm. multiple times and the way that you <laughs> hold the members of The Temptations accountable, right, as mm -hmm. they're sort of becoming these superstars mm -hmm. is also, a, I, I would say, essential part of mm -hmm. your work mm -hmm. and essential part of your work that's actually really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Something else that you said about sort of Pearl Clegg being one of your inspirations, who else are you inspired by in conversation with? Mm -hmm. Who uh, has helped lead the way for your work? Oh my God, that's a long list, you know, <laughs> that's a long one, you know, because it's poets too, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's Amiri Baraka, I mean, it is, obviously it's August Wilson, but it is Nikki Giovanni ma mainly, mm -hmm. um, Sonia Sanchez, uh, yep. Maya Angelou, these are writers' voices that I was reading like eighth grade, you know, um, that were showing me myself in a different way. Um, you know, there are local poets here in Detroit that are a big part of my influence, of how I saw the world, how I saw our city, very particularly, yeah. and how I see the world. Jessica Caremore, Kari Kamani Turner, um, Paradise, Pharaoh. These are uh, writers, and uh, Shanga Bay, that really shaped the, the way that I understood um, literature in Detroit and, mm -hmm. ma and made me raise the bar every time. You know, I used to perform at a space called Cafe Mahogany here in Detroit that in the late, late 90s and early 2000s was like, you know, a little bit of Mecca um, <laughs> for, for, for black poets in the city. Um, I come from like Dudley Randall and Broadside Press, like I come from studying those writers, you know. And then in the playwriting realm, uh, Cheryl West, mm -hmm. Nabia Kai, um, Lynn Nottage, these are, uh, Aisha Rahman, these are writers that I read growing up that, mm -hmm. and obviously like Ntozaki Shange, who basically created a whole another kind of play you can write, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like, oh, poetry and theater. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, and for a poet, my introduction into playwriting was Korea poem. Mm -hmm. And so that was all Ntozaki Shange. How do you think your introduction being into theater, being the choreo poem, shaped you as a writer, right? Because that's a, a really different sort of entryway into theater that maybe many of us, you know, in the audience or on the, on the live stream has encountered or entered the world of theater. How do you think that shaped you as a writer? Oh, majorly. I'm a poet. I'm a poet, you know. Um, I should say also, I have to say Alice Childress because uh, I grew up not only reading her work but performing it and using her work to get into college. Uh, <laughs> so thank you, Alice Childress. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I just, uh, the, my, I've never stopped being a poet to be a, a playwright. I've never mm -hmm. stopped, you know. And every now and again, the form, I, the, I break the form of like a traditional linear storytelling yeah. to go back to the poetry, you know, the Korea poem roots. It just depends on what's, you know, I sort of let the play tell me what it wants to be and then I go there, you know. But then I, you know, and then in Pipeline, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I could, I could fuse this a different kind of way. You know, we're gonna take Gwendolyn Brooks and we're gonna take a little bit of, you know, we're yeah. gonna get some Native Sun theme, theme, theme in there and we're gonna do some different stuff, you know. But it's all the, the writers that I've read growing up that I think uh, shape my thinking and, and, and my, the possibilities of what I could be doing, mm -hmm. you know, that it didn't have to fit. I would, it, they, this, is a, this is a lesson that they give in the play of Pipeline, but it was also my life lesson, which as a writer, which was um, Broadside Press printed Gwendolyn Brooks' poem, We Real Cool, in this like very differently structured way, right? You know, it didn't look grammatical. And in fact, I come, you know, I studied the black arts movement. And so the, the idea of like Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and Ntozaki Shange not writing like with the punctuation that was required of them, you know, at the time what was told was standard and correct, you know, kind of just like almost throwing a middle finger up to that, you know, um, really gave me a sense of like how we can write rebellion and just form. Mm -hmm. Just like the form itself is rebellion and that it is strategic and not, um, and not wasted, that it is a, uh, 
not without understanding and knowledge of whatever these rules are, but in complete and conscious defiance of them, I think was a part of me learning how to find my voice as an artist. Yeah, yeah and, and so in thinking about something like form and structure, um, so something I study is uh, black women in musical theater. And um, obviously you are a part of this ever expanding canon of that. Um, as someone who writes books for musicals, um, but also music and sound are already integral to the work that you produce. You know, whether it's the jazz club and Paradise Blue, or um, or the 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 ways that Jay Dilla's music is shaping the soundscape of Skeleton Crew. Um, it sound is is so important to the ways that you are dramaturgically constructing your stories. Um, and so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about. Uh, what you want people to walk away with sonically from your work? Like, what is the, what do you see as the, the role of, of music within these worlds you build? Because I think oftentimes we talk about musical theater, it's often like, you know, I don't know, Oklahoma. I don't know. I, I, knew, I knew you were going to say Oklahoma. I was like, I oh, mean, here no comes Oklahoma. Shade. No shade. It, it has endured for a reason. But it's just like, you know, when we it's like specifically Oklahoma. Yeah. That's <laughs> I, I do it. All right. I was like on the edge of my seat, be like, "Are you Rogers, say something Hammerstein, I'm so sorry." Um, but it's just like you know, we're we're very bound to this idea that there is there is a book, there is music, there's a there's a book, there's a score. There's not a kind of merging or a connection of these worlds. But black theater, your work, and Azaki Shange, you know, all the people you've mentioned have always used these worlds to, or these different mm -hmm. forms to build your world. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd love to just hear the role of music in your in your work. And yes. that's thank you. That's a, uh, I've been asked that question before, but not quite like that, <laughs> um, and in a great way, which is that for me. Uh, Music, you know, I grew up on music. I grew up dancing. I played the piano when I was younger. But I'm also married to a musician, a hip-hop artist, who actually scored the Broadway production of Skeleton Crew. Um, his name is Jay Keys. Yeah, I was like, drop the name. <laughs> Jimmy Keys, but Jay Keys is his performance name. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, who, uh, he expanded my, like, uh, musical literacy. Like, you know, if you're a hip-hop artist, your musical influence is way beyond hip-hop. It's like, mm -hmm. it's jazz, it's soul music very much. Um, hip-hop is a child of soul music. So, mm -hmm. you know, that, uh, I think that that is in me already, you know, how I hear the world and see the world around me. But I think um, it also, music is there to obviously build culture um, but and pay homage, mm -hmm. but it's also there to challenge. Um, my husband, Jimmy, also was the, uh, sound designer, co-sound designer for my play Confederates at um, at uh, Signature this last season. Thank you, Ooh. thank you for inviting us off Confederates. <laughs> um, and uh, and he did something so profound with this sound design that I just like my friend and I were just talking about it yesterday. <laughs> like this dude's a genius. I'm married to a genius, and I'm the one with the genius title, so I don't know how he feels. About <laughs> like that's got to be hard for him, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's praxis. Like, that, is, that is praxis. <laughs> like, how does a you know, real genius sit up here and be like, I got to call you the genius? <laughs> um, but, he, uh, but he did this thing with the sound design. We call it, he calls it, uh, critical race theory through sound design. Mm. Mm. You know? And it was one of those sounds where you, like, hear a song, and he'll flip the song on you, you know? Mm. Like, you'll hear a song that you think you know, and then he'll, like, show you its racist roots, you mm. know? In the in the in the music, which was going so effortlessly with the production, I mean, it was like this is one of my favorite productions of my plays, you know, I've ever seen because it was just like it was nerd, it was nerdism everywhere. It was like nerding out on everybody's like trip. It was like, oh my god, this set design is like so nerdy, yes. you know, like yes. oh my god, this like lighting design, like this is some like everybody was nerding out on their particular skill, you know, <laughs> and like it was just like going, we were going nuts up in there. It was so collaborative and you know everything. But anyway, my point being with that was like music was there to like uh, to add to the story of like we about hiding and covering you know, the, the roots, covering the roots um, of enslavement in this country and like what the, the, the white supremacist roots of that, like underneath so many things that we take for granted on a daily basis. And so I was like, this is just like, 
Yeah, I get it. It's like, I feel like there's like a jazz symphony going on in my head all the time. You know, it's just like, and it's when it gets really particularly crazy, it starts, you know, going off like a Miles Davis riff, you know? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you just like, it just, it, it, I, I nerd out on music, um, even though I would never call myself like an aficionado of really any of it. Uh, <laughs> maybe R&B, I'm an aficionado of R&B. <laughs> Specifically nice. 90s R&B, that's, I'm stuck there. <laughs> You know, um, this has nothing to do with theater, but right. who are your, your 90s R&B go-to? Oh my God, like TLC, yes. like, like <laughs> SWV, yes. these are people that like, you know, I was really into like Jodeci and Boyz II yes. Men, and also um, like some of the other, like Silk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyway, just like whatever, yeah. Deep do, cut. I could do. I could throw some '90s R&B at you that you'd be like, <laughs> um, uh, in, in Vogue. Okay, that's the last one. So, but, but I'm just. I'm. I could. I love music a lot, and it just comes. I can't even hear. I write to music. You know, mm -hmm. I write to music. I have to play music. I had to do my homework for music. You know, mm -hmm. they'd be like, I can't think. Cut the music off. I'm like, no, I can't think. Cut the music on. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and it just helps me, it calms me and it helps me like stay in the world that I'm writing about. Yeah, and when you were writing for, um, for Ain't Too Proud and like writing with mm -hmm. existing music, yeah. right? Music that has shaped the popular music landscape of this country, but also like the, um, you know, shaping people's childhoods and their connections to it. What was the process of, what was the process like in, in writing um, a story about people that, you know, we already know, but like trying to find maybe those accountability pieces that we were talking about earlier, but also like the, um, the, the nuances of, um, of how we understand these really major figures like The Temptations. Yeah. Well, the goal for me with Ain't Too Proud was, I mean, there was already a Temptations movie <laughs> that everybody in black America knows every line to. So, go to bed, Joseph. Right. Go to yeah. bed. <laughs> Ain't nobody coming to see you, you Otis. I was, right. When we seen it, I was like, is the line going to be in Right. I, well, here's the I thing. <laughs> I was like, everybody that, see, that knows this movie, including my mother, who's like got it on VHS and stuff. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so I'm like, everybody that sees this uh, musical is going to be looking for, Ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. So I can't, I obviously cannot take that line. I got to find my own version yeah. of Ain't nobody coming to see you, Otis. And yeah. I have one. Yeah. <laughs> this is not, it's not that. But it's close. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Like, ain't nobody cheering to fall out of, out of their seats when Otis walk out on the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ain't nobody changing gods when Otis sing, you know. Yeah. Anyway, so, but there's a, there, I, had to, I had to elevate a little bit. Yeah, you know, make, yeah, yeah. Make it theater worthy, you know. But that was, that was for me, the whole, um, the whole time of writing Ain't Too Proud was about we already, if you're, I'm from Detroit, so everybody already knows the temptation story, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm not gonna shock my city, I'm not gonna uh, impress my city, or, or I know, I'm sorry, we all like pausing because we hear phones. <laughs> um, um, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna change anybody's mind, I'm not gonna do anything for my city if I tell the story they already know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have to tell a little bit of the story they already know because then, then they're gonna go, she didn't know the story. She didn't yeah. tell the story that I know. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to like walk this line, you know? Mm -hmm. So for me, when I was reading um, Otis's biography, that's, and I also sort of had this, I'm gonna be very honest, you know, when they first brought the Temptations musical to me, I was like, oh Lord, we already got Motown a musical. We don't need this, you know? Like, I don't know if I wanna do this, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then I started reading o Otis's biography and I was like, oh no. Mm -hmm. No, this is something we could do. Mm -hmm. Because it was at the time, I think it was like around 2015, 2016. And it was during that time when the first, I think, wave, you know, Trayvon Martin had already been killed. And Mike Brown had already been killed. Ferguson had happened. I think Philando Castile had just started. And Alton Sterling had just happened, you know. And so we were in that first wave uh, of, of Black Lives Matter and of, like, people, you know, before they were, like, writing Black Lives Matter in the streets. This is when Black Lives Matter was, like, called terrorists, right? And so, uh, but when that was happening, artists, we were going, what do we do? You know, we were in that first wave of civic unrest that mm -hmm. like this country was starting, the, the break that the country was in was starting around then, you know? And, um, and I, was, I, I was feeling at that time, like, man, as a artist, as a, somebody who's performing in theater and doing all this stuff, like, what, what do we do? Like, what, how do we respond to these times? But also, like, what is our role as artists? And how do we stay visible 
when the world is coming undone, like where, what's our place? And then I was reading about the Temptations and they were dealing with the 1967 rebellion yeah. in Detroit and they were, you know, they were dealing with civic unrest and they were artists in the time when the world was falling apart in the late 60s, you know, before Dr. King had even been killed. And, but, but after Malcolm X, so people always talk about King and they never talk about Malcolm, like, like Malcolm's death didn't also change and impact the world, but it absolutely did and it impacted um, Detroiters' lives very much. You know, we, the, we, they mourn both of those men with equality, you know? And so, but I think about that time from 65 to 68, you know, and what, what the temptations must have felt like rising and being the kind of, you know, being out here and performing and singing in front of, you know, white audiences and black audiences that were like segregated. And like, what was that doing to their minds? And, you know, and then I started reading what it was doing to their minds. And I was like, oh man, they were, they were just like us. You know, going like, what do we do? And what? No, man, but we gotta, we gotta, you know, we got, we have a dream. We gotta still follow our dreams, but this is a weird time, you know. <laughs> and like, how do you, how do you reconcile all that? And then, and then you're watching yourself be used to like, when you see that moment when you're performing with them, you know, they they go to hell with these ropes and yeah. these barriers, and they start dancing with each other, and you're like, oh, I'm singing. My singing is doing that, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. But you're being used. Your music is being used to to bridge the world when it's divided. That's, that's gotta feel like a hell of a burden. Mm -hmm. um, and then you as an artist are also trying to fight for your like visibility, um, what you feel like you are owed, what is you know, fair to you um, through you know, not just Motown, but also with each other. It was just a lot. And I, I thought this is the stuff for me that I don't think when you talk about Motown, you talk about the temptations, that's, you're not talking about that. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about when they striked, mm -hmm. <laughs> when they wanted to strike, and when they got in a fight about it. And Eddie Kendricks called them all berry ass kissers. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna put that in the play, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see if Barry Gordy approves it. You know, <laughs> and he did. You know, um, and so those are the kind of things for me that I and I and I when I look at when I look at music, I go. You know, you're singing about a, you know, a song like I Wish It Would Rain. You feel like you're singing, mm -hmm. oh, that's a man singing to a woman. But what was happening underneath that? Mm -hmm. Feels like that, was, that song was yeah. in, a, in a time when all this stuff was going on. We got to, well, I'm going to show you 10 layers underneath that song mm -hmm. and take that out of being romantic at, at all. That song is about something way deeper than that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was the fun of playing with a catalog. You know, I, I'm only going to play with a catalog. I'm only going to do a catalog musical if I can, like, totally disrupt that catalog, you know? Yeah, yeah. And be like, ooh, but have you thought about it like this? <laughs> what if that was about two brothers in the group singing to each other? That wasn't about, you know, very my, one very linear man, woman, very, very small, myopic <laughs> relationship of love. Like, this was gonna be about something way broader than that. Um, and so that was the fun of doing that for their, for their music, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Ain't Too Proud, and I, also, I'm very familiar with that Temptation yes. film. I literally was yeah. young, and I'm like, I'm the Eddie this time, and me and my little brother would like literally reenact. Yeah, <laughs> like, love that movie. So, yeah. and I and I, what I love about Into Proud also is that I feel like it's a shift away from what we often think of as the jukebox musical, mm -hmm. where it's just kind of like these songs exist mm -hmm. within this musical, but they actually don't necessarily have any sort of theoretical or not theoretical. Um, storyline thread like it's just like they're kind of like plopped in there and we move we move we move i felt like ain't too proud is something completely different a reinvention of what we would call the jukebox musical um but transitioning mm -hmm. obviously we in your city mm -hmm. we're in detroit mm -hmm. um and you know you talked extensively about your love of, D of detroit and, and how it influenced you and i'm gonna read from your uh, dedication from Detroit 67. Mm -hmm. And you wrote, Detroit is my family, my best friends, my husband, my first love, my creative genesis, my heart. This for your imperfection, your truth, and your ongoing survival through the decades, end quote. Mm -hmm. You also noted that the impetus to write about Detroit came from a desire to create homegrown narrators. This city is a central component of the work you produce. There's your Detroit Cycle, your work as a book writer for Ain't Too Proud, and now your upcoming work, Soul Train. It's also your home and the place you grew up. What lessons can we learn from Detroit history and culture as we move forward in theater? 
Oh, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can tell you what I learned. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't know. There's a lot to learn in Detroit. I mean, you, you know, I was taking some friends around the town, you know, uh, while they were here for the Black Theater Network conference, which was amazing. And um, shout out to BTN. BTN, yes. yes. But, uh, and while we were here for that, you know, I was, I was like, you can, uh, in Detroit, you're going to, it's kind of like Harlem, mm -hmm. where, you know, you get off and you kind of walk and you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes was like, <laughs> Zora Neale was is she here? <laughs> you know, it's like this sort of the thing. If you walk around Detroit, you know, specifically in certain areas, like whoa, David Ruffin's black, and where he met Otis Williams, they used to meet on this corner. You know, mm -hmm. Aretha Franklin was over here. Mm -hmm. This is where Rosa Parks was, and this mm -hmm. is where uh, Pearl Clegg, Reverend Albert Clegg. You know, that's mm -hmm. her father. Yeah. You know, and that he, uh, you know, started the Shrine of the Black Madonna right here. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of like ancestors here. Mm -hmm. um, as maybe everywhere, but like there's a, you can feel the deep rooted history of, of, of Detroit when you're here. And, and you know, I, I highly recommend a tour by Jamon Jordan. Mm -hmm. He is the historian of Detroit, that's named by the mayor. Mm -hmm. And he gives a hell of a tour, Black Scroll Network. For anyone who wants an amazing tour on Detroit, Jamon Jordan is, is my number one recommend. But, uh, you know, he'll, you'll, you'll see the history of the Underground Railroad here. Detroit was called Midnight on the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so I, it just, you know, the, the, the history of resistance, John Brown had meeting space here in Detroit, you know, and so just to like know the, the history of rebellion and, um, and, and strategy, strategic fight, resistance, and building, and nation building is here in the city. Um, and I think that for me growing up, that just meant, you know, I also have a, I think it's hard for people to hear this, uh, hear things like black nationalism. Black nationalism sounds like something else than mm -hmm. what it did for me growing up. Black nationalism sounds like all kind of nationalism, which I think we um, have seen the danger of nationalism, you know? Um, just, we've seen the danger of like nationalistic points of views. But I think black nationalism, as it has been Detroit, as it has been cultivated here in Detroit, is not born out of oppression. You know, it's not like, I've heard people comparing white nationalism and black nationalism, for instance, right? And I would just, I would, I would offer a difference, you know, of the root, right? The root of white nationalism and the root of black nationalism are very different roots, right? One is rooted in oppression and one is rooted in fighting oppression. So they're going to have a different, uh, uh, just they're going to, from that route, they're going to go very different directions, right? And so Detroit has had a very uh, raised in black culture, black history, you know. I, my, my best, and I mean that from everybody. So like I went to a school where the best black history program put on ever was from our Chinese American teacher. And I mean, when I tell you, this was like next level. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he ran a, a, it's from kindergarten to eighth grade. Mm. We had like this thing, I went to Bates Academy. We had this thing called Bates Battle. And Bates Battle had kindergartners squaring off. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And like family feud style, who's gonna hit the buzzer first, you know? And like, you had to put teams together. I was in the fourth grade, we had to put a team together. You know, who's, let me see if you're smart enough to be on my Bates Battle team. <laughs> and know this black history, you know? And then we had to audition <laughs> for this thing to be the team chosen for our grade, you know? <laughs> and you see kindergarten up there like, who wants Van Peanut Butter? George Washington Carver, you know? <laughs> I mean, it was just like, it was, it was epic. And you could, be, you could, you could like, um, you could see like the, the, the intensity of us learning about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, Mr. Yee is um, one of my favorites because of this, you know? Because he knew he was in a school and in a city that was predominantly black. And that black culture and black history was not like, a, a gimmick that it was, it had to be integral and in us knowing who we are. So I grew up, so the point is, I think growing up in a city where there are reflections of the people who live in that city, you know, so that they don't feel like the minority or they don't feel like less than mm -hmm. was a huge part of, I think, the entire um, pedagogy mm -hmm. of being raised in Detroit. And thus the police force did not, I did not grow up with the fear of the police, like I'm sure that, that I now feel for my son. 
I did not feel that way. Sorry, I touched the mic. I did not feel that way growing up. The police were my friends. I feel like what I imagined, you know, maybe in a predominantly white community, what young white children will feel about the police, not afraid of them. But like, if you're in trouble, you go to them, right? I grew up in a, in a city in the 80s and 90s feeling like I could go to the police. That's, that's different from me where I'm living right now, right? I feel very nervous every time I even see the presence of police. I feel like I, I'm not sure if, you know, how you gonna see me, friend or foe? How you gonna see my husband? How you gonna see my son? Friend or foe, I don't feel like I can go to you. In fact, people use the police as weapons against me for something as simple as like, I parked in a parking spot you want. I'm gonna call the police. Whoa, that's like waving a gun at me right now, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's a, there's a whole different feeling of that when you're, when you're um, raised differently than how I was raised here, which was that this police force comes from this community. I know my mom knows the chief or so-and-so knows that there were those cousins that feel something, feels like home and not like um, we're on opposite, opposite sides of life. It's a terrible way to feel in your side of your own community, you know? Um, and so anyway, I just say all that to say that's to me, those are the, the lessons that one can learn from this city is just a lesson in how to, um, how much reflecting one, how much being aware of the psyche of not, of feeling like other can be dangerous. And I'm sure there were, uh, white people felt like the other, I think, in Detroit growing up. Eminem has, he didn't grow up in Detroit, but he grew up adjacent to Detroit, you know? <laughs> I'm sure he, he felt like other until he didn't, you know, until he felt like he felt other to white people, I think, but he didn't feel other to black folks, you know, because he grew up as a part of that culture. So it's, 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 it's almost like the reverse of the rest of the world. I had a t when I went to Ann Arbor and went to Michigan, I was like, come confused <laughs> my life. I was just, I was like, I felt like Detroit had done me dirty. Like, oh, this is really confusing. <laughs> so we are not. <laughs> the majority, you know what I mean? I didn't understand um, us in relation to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It was truly Detroit versus everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. why they have t-shirts called that. Uh, you, you got yeah. t-shirts? Yeah, I do. I have like 20. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I feel the exact same way. I grew up in Atlanta, and then when I went to college, I was like, oh, wait, I'm the other? That's not correct. Um. <laughs> but you can understand, like, so it's also that feeling of being other, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a, I now know both sides. I know what it feels like to be the majority. Mm -hmm. I have this weird, you know, I have this weird experience in life now where I know what it's like to be the majority and the minority, you know. Mm -hmm. I know both of those feelings, and I, I, I'm like, I, I think most people would prefer, I think it feels better to be the majority. <laughs> <laughs> but what it really feels better is to be equal, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm in a, a pretty diverse community where I live in L.A., and mm -hmm. I'm like, if we could just somehow could keep it balanced, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see no, no reflections of myself, but I also think everybody's got to get out of what they're comfortable with and go be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, you'll never understand the whole world if you're only seeing one one part. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah, and yes, yeah. let's get a clap on that. Yes, you know. Um, yeah, I think that fostering like experiences, um, you know, that center black folks or, or specifically black women in your work. Um, are obviously something that Leticia and I have gravitated towards um, as being um, a black theater podcast focused on black feminist perspectives. Um, and so, you know, your most recent work, Confederates, um, in that play you present parallel experiences um, of black women who are living over a century apart from one another. Um, and one of those characters is someone who is a tenured professor in a private university. Um, and as we are at a, a conference about theater and higher education, um, I, I'm interested in, in that play's critique of, of institutional racism across all of these different institutions that you present, whether it's the literal institution of slavery mm -hmm. or the, mm -hmm. the institution of the, the private university. Mm -hmm. um, so what, yeah, what, what kind of critiques were you leveraging there and and what was the the um, impetus in presenting these parallels, parallels yeah. to one another? Yeah. Well, I should say where the source of the play came from. It came mm -hmm. from a commission by OSF uh, as part of their American Revolutions series, right? Um, 
But it was a partnership between OSF and Penumbra Theater in Minneapolis, mm -hmm. and Lou Bellamy approached me. So it was really Lou's vision mm -hmm. that got me into that uh, commissioning program. And his vision was, hey, Dominique, there's this ta Coates article mm -hmm. uh, that asked the question, why don't more black writers and scholars talk about and write about the black participation in the Civil War? And I thought, that sounds nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is good company for nerdy. <laughs> yeah, nerdy you know. I was like, that sounds nerdy and heady and boring. And that sounds like I'm just going to be writing about slavery. I don't know if I want to do that, you know? And as I thought about it more, <laughs> I'm a, I am a nerd called everything nerdy. Um, but as I thought about it more, uh, I was like, well, you know, every time you ask me, if you ask me what's going on during the Civil War, I'm, the first question I'm going to ask is, well, where were the black women? What were Ooh. they doing? Ooh. That was my first question. Um, and then, you know, and then I, you know, I was like, well, then, you know, what am I going to write about some black woman hiding and turning herself into a man to get in the army? <laughs> what am I going to do? You know, like, what is this going to be? We've seen that story a little bit. Sorry for anybody that's writing that right now. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be original. It just wasn't going to be original in my brain. <laughs> and, so, um, and so I was like, what, what is that going to look like? And then I thought, oh, no. And there was already that like slavery fatigue going on with mm -hmm. like social media. We're talking about how they don't want to see no more stories about slaves. And I was like, come on, no more? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> One more? We haven't even seen Harriet yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we have to wait until Harriet Tubman gets her due. Yeah. And maybe Sojourner Truth, you know, yeah. and some others. Yeah. So I'm like, OK. So I had this flip. I was like, well. If I'm going to write about Civil War, I can't do it in a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. like that's, I think the thing for me is that I can't be subtle. I don't want to be like, you know, you watch stories about slavery, you go, there are so many parallels today. I was like, what are they? <laughs> Let's make them obvious, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I just, you know, because we, get, we have this removal, you know? And I'm like, no removal. I don't want us to be removed. I don't want this to be comfortable, you know? I want it to be more uncomfortable. Let's mm -hmm. just make it really direct. And so that was what made me go, you know, Higher education, <laughs> you know. Um, let's look at the roots of institutional racism, mm -hmm. and you know, I mean, it's, it's schools that are on plantations. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, that are built by plantation money. So let's just let's look at it. Really, let's look at the parallel, um, and let's look at who's in those schools and who's being targeted in those schools, and how where where is the space? Uh, and this also has come from my own. I've done a lot of like visiting scholarship to different universities friends of mine who were educators who I came and spend like a week or two or sometimes several weeks mm -hmm. at that university. I couldn't believe the shit that was going on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I, I could not believe it. I was like, <laughs> I can't believe that you thought she said she just talked to you that way. I can't believe like, mm. I can't believe you're having a hard time getting tenure, Nicole Hanna. Anyway, um, well, you know, I just, I can't <laughs> believe you're, you're not being respected at this university. I can't believe this student was allowed to talk to you that way. Or this, like, this is crazy. What's happening? You know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah, I just, sorry. <laughs> Somebody's got to talk about this shit, you know? <laughs> Somebody's got to put this on front street right now. Mm -hmm. And also, I think I also just remember, I remember my own student experience with institutions. Like I told you, once I got to Michigan, you know, and I have a lot of, you know, I have ambivalence about Michigan. I, I've, I've taught there. I think there's some great stuff that have come out of there. I've had great relationships and, you know, go blue, <laughs> you know? And also, you know, a lot of hard, horrible stuff happened to me in Michigan that made me want to just quit all the things. Um, and I did not see reflections in my stuff, and I had to fight. And then I watched my professors fight and get slammed, and then I felt disappointed in those black professors who I didn't feel could stand up to this white university for us. So then I felt like I had to do it myself, and I remember getting in a fight with one of my professors. Um, and I was like, this is something crazy. I said some crazy shit to him, but you know, I was so, I was so mad uh, uh, about theater. You know, he, I think uh, another professor had told him, like, cancel one of my shows I had like the only I said you're gonna make him that tell you to let make you cancel the only black show at this school I think I said something to him like well you're not gonna do it so I have to you know but I that was the truth though he was not feeling comfortable you know being the black professor putting up a black production and I was like but we're like three or four of us here if you're not gonna do it nobody's gonna do it mm -hmm. and so then no one did it while I was at school you know uh 
correction, Michelle Shea brought in Alice Childress my first year, and she wow. changed my life. So, mm -hmm. you know, but there were not, <laughs> there weren't enough, we weren't studying us, you know, I was so frustrated. And then I saw my professors, like, feel like they had to be, you know, didn't want to look like the black professor that was going to look out for the black students, you know. Mm -hmm. They were scared of what their white colleagues were going to think of them that they didn't have the gall to say, hey, there's an imbalance, and somebody's got to make some space over here. Um, and so I also, that's all in, in Confederates, too. Two black professors have that debate mm -hmm. in Confederates about, like, who should they be there for? All the students. Yes, all the students. I can be all the students, but then I can also make myself available to these students. And, you know, they, they have that debate a little bit. Um, because I just, yeah, I just want to make space, and I want to stamp out the institution of racism that's at these schools that we won't, we keep hushing about, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you, we keep hushing about it. You've got faculty, you've got tenured faculty that's been there abusing like generations of students and then you got these other faculty members that can't get tenure. It's ridiculous, you know, it doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. So I think it's just, yeah, it's gotta get addressed and hopefully, uh, hopefully the play will help to like start some conversations, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. We are coming, a to a close of our questions before we open it up to the audience for questions. But before we wrap up, yeah. I want to ask you a really unfair and hard question. What <laughs> you know, you know, I'm asking. <laughs> oh, it's unfair. Like, don't yeah. you do it. Like, which child do you love best? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like to that. To be live streamed like and archived. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I want you to. Uh, Think about what the state of American theater is, and maybe even black theater, and what you hope for the future for our industry. Uh, yeah. I told I mean, you it was unfair. Yeah, it is unfair. <laughs> I certainly don't have that answer by myself. I, I do think that I would like to see, uh, I would like to see us not practice imperialism in the theater, right? And what I mean by that is I, I grew up thinking there was being taught, because I never thought it actually, <laughs> actually never thought this, but I grew up being taught that there was uh, one God and that we all obey the God, uh, that uh, the God is the greatest God of writing, and we know who that God is <laughs> in theater, right? But that God of Shakespeare, and then everyone that comes out of that tradition, and then, so there, there was just never any room for what if that isn't my God? What if that's not my God? Well, then you don't know theater and you shouldn't be practicing it. That seems silly. But also, <laughs> I, it, what if that's not my God? You know, I think we, I, I, and, I, and this, is, this is across the board, actually. This isn't, um, I mean, this is everybody. I feel like we've all, like, we have this, like, way that we decide that this is good theater. And if you don't subscribe to this religion, you're an infidel of theater, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so I just, um, I would like to see us expand the, the, um, the inclusion of the canon, not just of the present, but also of the past. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see us like open yeah. up to the other gods out there mm -hmm. that have ruled this, you know, thing called, I mean, because theater is not like, you know, it's like when we start doing inventions, you know, like I always say this about like hip hop theater, you know, it's as if, you know, the audience that goes to see Hamilton thinks that they discovered hip hop theater. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they sure do. I'm like, what? <laughs> Where you been? Camilla Forbes, Danny Hawk, and Clyde Valentine started the hip hop theater festival mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. By the time I moved to New York City, it's 2000. 2004, I was a part of the third annual Hip Hop Theater Festival that birthed the likes of Lin Manuel Miranda. You know, it's like I, I love that the culture can shift and change and people can get invited into it, but I cannot take the erasure. You know, mm -hmm. we cannot mm -hmm. start writing your history at the day I discovered you. It's not Christopher Columbus. This place has been here. Yes. You know? It's, it's, so I'd like to see us abandon the Christopher Columbus School of, <laughs> once I put the flag there, that's when it started happening, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, this is, there, there are so many traditions that we have like, t like ignored mm -hmm. and don't make space for it in the past, so therefore we don't make space for their descendants today. 
right? I, I, I'm, I am flabbergasted at how I don't see more Latinx playwrights being done. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I just can't even believe it. It just blows my mind, really, you know? As, even as black women playwrights, we are probably, um, you know, of the uh, non-white writers, probably getting the, like, loudest due as black gay men and black women playwrights, mm -hmm. right? Of the, I guess, you know, people of the global majority, are, you know? And I, I go, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, with all of this, like, the anti-Asian hate and the anti-Latinx and the putting, you know, Latinx kids in cages, you gotta be kidding me if you're not, like, out here censoring those voices right now. Like, I don't even understand what's the fear. And I know so many gifted Latinx writers, so I'm confused. Um, I'm just very confused by that. So, yeah, you know, that's just a whole other thing. But I just, but the point is, that, that, and those are all of the multiple gods out there that I'm talking about. Like, they have descendants, mm -hmm. you know, they have roots, they have ancestors um, uh, of, of the word that we are not taught is so also important and valuable, and that aesthetic is valuable. And we, if we're going to call American theater, like truly American theater, it's got to take in, every, everybody's ancestors got to be welcome to the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. So, yeah. So our final question, I know Latisha said it was a final question, I'm sorry. Um, our final question is hopefully a fun one, but what's next for you in terms of projects? <laughs> I'm really deeply uh, trying to slow down. Um, but I, you know, Soul Train the Musical is next for me in the theater. I yes. can't do nothing else before I do that play. <laughs> but I do that musical, where a lot of people will be angry with me. But, <laughs> but I also do have another play, uh, Bad Creole, which is about my Haitian American experience. Um, yeah, I'm Haitian. Sac Passe, it says the Haitian folks out there, if there are any. <laughs> um, we also have, just for people to know, there's a Haitian, the Haitian Network of Detroit has a Haitian festival this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, if you would like to check that out, uh, you can just look that up online, Haitian Network of Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, so that's next for me. I'm finally tapping into, like, I'm owning my Haitian self. Um, and then I'm also trying to, you know, do some things very locally here in Detroit, actually. I don't live here, but I, uh, I build here. So mm -hmm. I have a home I'm, I'm working on rehabbing right now and turning into an arts residency center. Um, and so that's my husband and I, it's just our, it's both of ours, it'll be for performing artists of all kinds, um, to be able to come to Detroit and build with the people that are here. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, and then my play Mud Row is having its premiere at my theater, Detroit Public Theater in September, at our new theater space. We mm -hmm. have our own theater now. Woo. So things, good things. You said you're slowing down? Uh, you said you're slowing down? Yeah, I heard <laughs> slowing down, but then I heard all the... <laughs> Slowing down in a certain kind of a sense. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, thank you so much, Dominique, for talking with us. I mean, we are just thrilled that you are, are, um, are talking to Daughters of the Rain. Yeah. And it's taken a lot of us for to act like, oh, professional and like cordial me. and like not to be up in a fan but inside we're about to like, ah, can you believe it? <laughs> so, <Same>. um, <laughs> so this is just amazing. Um, so we want to open it up to questions um, uh, for for folks who may have questions for for Dominique and yeah. If you raise your hand, I think Amy is in the back with a mic. I have one over there too. Oh, and and, and, and Devin. There. There's so many. Oh, yeah. We can't see because the lights kind of bright. So. <laughs> lights and the yes. All right. Uh, hi, I am uh, Zach Daly. I'm so happy to be here uh, with uh, and in the, your presence, right? The presence of Daughters of Lorraine and also of Dominique Mariso. Um, I had the pleasure and honor of presenting yesterday uh, about your Detroit project um, and how you construct Detroit's identity as a place and a region uh, through your plays. Um, and in that paper, I argued about um, how uh, you view Detroit's regional identity through uh, a lens of ancestors and elders. And I take that through from your dedications and from the fact that these characters in your plays are being haunted by ancestors, uh, whether that's haunted in a, a positive way or in a negative way, right? Um, so I wondered if you could speak just a bit to that. Um, and then also I wanted you to know that uh, a student of mine, um, who was failed by a predominantly white institution 
uh, but decided to come back to the two-year college I, I teach at. Um, I gave her uh, my copy of the Detroit Project. And, um, and uh, just like how you uh, were affected by Alice Childress, she was affected by you. So I just want you to know that, um, that for the young women out there, for the young black women out there, you make a difference. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> no, really, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I would never know without stories that you tell me like these. So thank you so much. And that, that, that is, it really gives so much meaning to anything that I create. So I, I really do appreciate it. And for everybody that teaches my work, I just, uh, to be, I mean, that blows my mind, really, uh, that I could go from, like, searching for my own voice in my school to be able to be a voice for other students like me growing up. So that, I mean, that's major to me. So thank you so much. I mean that but from the bottom of my heart as an educator to an educator. Um, uh, and I would say for the, uh, um, the history and the ancestors and the, you know, I think what I learned about, so my father, um, my father, I lost my father in 2020. And uh, like literally the month before the pandemic hit, questionably, uh, <laughs> the moment, the moment before everything shut down. Let's use that marker. And um, and so I uh, I sort of keep talking about him and speaking him up. But he, my father, is so present in so many of my plays. And what I remember is before my father had passed, all of his other friends had died like so many years before him. And um, my father was the one man who read all of my plays and, you know, and gave me unsolicited feedback for all of my plays. <laughs> and, um, and also uh, was just very influential. So when I was writing Detroit 67, I stole my parents' memories, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and I would talk to them about just like word choices and like, you know, I, I swagger jack my dad, as they would say. <laughs> um, there's a whole like back and forth between sly and length in that mm -hmm. play, where it's like, what's the word, Thunderbird, what's the price, 30 twice, my man, you know. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that was my daddy, he gave me that one, I mean, I stole that one, <laughs> you know. Yeah, um, but the reason I bring that up, and then my father, um, there is a, in the scenery of Detroit 67, there's a star, mm -hmm. four-pointed star, and there's all this stuff that, you know, writing on the basement walls. My father wrote on our basement walls, and there is the four-pointed star on the wall of my basement right now. I took some friends to see my childhood home, and there, there it is, you know. And I was like, I gotta do something to preserve this, like, no matter what happens to this house, this star must remain as a landmark for me, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I just say all that to say, what I realized in writing Detroit 67 sort of is like a metaphor for all of the plays, which was my father lost all of his friends, but the way he talks about Detroit 67 and Sly and Lank, it's like he's talking about his best friend, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, oh, oh, plays, theater can resurrect the dead. And it could bring your, your elders and your ancestors and your former best friends right back to you. And here you are having, a, if you're playing them, you're having a dialogue with them. Yeah. If you're watching them on the stage, like you're just like, they're just jumping in your lap. And I was able to give my father his friends back, you know, mm -hmm. with Detroit 67. And now I'm giving myself, my father back through my whole Detroit cycle and through many of my plays. So um, ancestry for me is very embedded into the soul of my plays for that reason. Hi, I'm Ashley Lucas. I teach at the University of Michigan in the Department of Theater and Drama. And I'm sorry you had some bad experiences there, but uh, <laughs> nobody's going to get out of any. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, but we are very proud of you, and everybody claims you. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I bring you greetings and honor from the University of Michigan Theater and Drama Department. Um, my, I, in hearing you talk about the ancestors, I was wondering also how you're using theater to connect with people who, I mean, clearly a lot of your plays are representing people who don't often see themselves on major stages. And we used Pipeline last year um, with the Prison Creative Arts Project, which is a program that I work with. We do theater workshops in prisons with incarcerated people. And we've been shut out since the pandemic, but we got permission for the first time since we were working remotely to mail in books to people in prison. So we chose Pipeline as the thing to send in. And Wayne State University did a production of Pipeline that same semester, and a whole bunch of formerly incarcerated people and the students in my class went to see that and were writing and corresponding with the people in prison, reading your play. 
And what the folks in prison were talking about in relation to pipeline had a lot to do with finding that tension between themselves and their teachers when they were young people and looking for the parents and mentors who uh, both could have fought for them in the way that you described your own teachers at Michigan not fighting for you in the way that you needed them to yeah. and um, how quickly they were dismissed and funneled into that pipeline towards mm -hmm. prison mm -hmm. in the way that your play so, so beautifully describes. So I'm just wondering if there are other instances in your work or ways that you as a playwright are working for the people who can't always get to the theater, who don't know that their stories are there, but uh, because of the, the enormity of your success in recent years, your work actually is translating to some of those audiences who don't have the privilege of being present in the theater. Yeah, thank you for that. That was an excellent question. I, because I, um, you know, when I, when I first wrote Pipeline and did it at Lincoln Center Theater, I mean, this sort of is, uh, it has roots in why I even have that statement that I now do with all of my plays, which is the, the audience invitation, yeah. you know, to be yourselves in the audience, you know. But that started with Lincoln Center and Pipeline because I was going to be doing Pipeline. Um, I don't know if, you know, for those who don't know, it's, you know, it's just about a, a, a mother and her son who's, she's a, a public school teacher, her son is a private school student. And what happens when he's accused of putting his hands on a teacher and they threaten him with criminal charges and expulsion. And so she's trying to figure out how to rally him back and get him, save him, save him from the pipeline. Um, and when I was doing it at Lincoln Center, my cast was so concerned about uh, just telling this like very personal story to black motherhood and to and everything that was going on in the world at the time, because that was 2017. So you see where we are in the timeline of civic unrest in our country. And, um, and so I promised, they were, they were nervous to do that in front of Lincoln Center. It's very like older, you know, predominantly white, but also privileged, economically privileged audience. And so I was like, okay, well then I gotta change the audience, you know? Mm -hmm. And so what I did on the first, second preview was I ran down to the audience and said, um, if you wanna see, you know, if you think this is important enough for a young person to see, come talk to me at the top of the, you know, stairs. And then I took everybody's uh, information who wanted to contribute. And I thought, oh, I could do an Indiegogo campaign and just you know, get some money raised for some teenagers to come see this, right? But what they ended up turning into was I, I reached out to Lincoln Center, we did a matching grant, and so we got enough money to get like 500 teenagers in New York City to come see Pipeline. And when I say teenagers, I, this was not during school, so it wasn't necessarily 500 students. It was like teenagers, you know? You could be on the subway, I'd be like, hey, you wanna come see a play? They'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Walk over to Lincoln Center, go get you a free ticket to show your ID, you know? It was like that, right? And so we got, we serviced 500 students, I mean, t teenagers to come see Pipeline for free. Um, but that was one way in which I wanted to change Lincoln Center's audience and make it uh, just d more divert, look like a New York City subway. And for a very long part of that run, that is what that audience looked like, because it started to be word of mouth and they started to go back to their the non-traditional communities of the Lincoln Center, at least. That's not their traditional audience. It started to be more of that. And now I'm really trying to get Pipeline into even more kind of local communities. That's something I'm working at right now with Center Theater Group in, in California. Try to figure out how can we take this play on tour. I'm kind of tired of doing these plays about, I know that Pipeline speaks to young people more probably than mostly almost any other my, of my plays. Maybe Sunset Baby, that also speaks to young folk, you know. But like Pipeline is where they see themselves. We also have formerly incarcerated young men that came and saw the show. And we're like, I do remember one young man saying, if, if my mother could have seen this with me, I think it could have changed our relationship for the better, you know, because of the rules and the, yeah. that happened at the end and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think it's also, I feel the disconnect, specifically from young people to theater and to also, I used to also take students with a T, C, TDF. I used to take students from TDF to go see Broadway shows. And I just remember some of the experiences, you know, them being hushed. I remember they came to see my play Santa Baby, then I took them to a Broadway show. And I remember asking them how they felt, and they were like, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> but you know, they're on Broadway, you know what I mean? But they're like, this feels kind of stuck. They, don't, they didn't feel like they fully belonged, yeah. you know? And I was like, there, I am still working, I'm, I'm still working to try to, one, make them feel like they belong, but two, not make them have to come here to get it. Mm -hmm. That's the harder part. But, you know, theaters want it in their hearts. I don't know 
they can give it their yes. Yeah. Hello, it's Anita. Hi. Hi. I was at Michigan, as you know. Yeah. Um, I just want you to talk a little bit more about the Confederates. I want, um, because it does talk about, because we're educators here, and because the play does talk about the educational institutions as plantations. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if it's available for purchase, mm -hmm. and if you see a way in which that play could be mobilized in higher education settings to bring about change. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to. I, could, I should say right now it is in uh, rehearsal to be open at um, OSF. So mm -hmm. it is in production at OSF right now. Um, and I have not seen their production, but I do know Nataki Garrett, and she and I have talked, and so uh, they were supposed to premiere it before the pandemic. So um, I give that part to that. But also, yeah, I mean, I would love to see Confederates get to institutions of higher learning and do, and shake up a lot of stuff, <laughs> you know. I think that um, we had a lot of educator nights when we were doing it as uh, signature theater, we had a lot of professors, a lot of scholars, you know, black women professors in particular. Uh, some uh, had a lot of students um, come to see the play and be uh, advocates for it or talk about it, share their experiences. Mm -hmm. So many similar experiences um, that I would like to see it get educators from a, similarly, like now, across the country in conversation with each other and also in action with each other. You know, because I know how we feel about 100 conversations, but <laughs> conversations are very necessary. I do think we should be talking to each other. We just can't, we just, it just can't stop at like, talk about it, think about it, we'll see you next year, you know. It definitely needs to be talk about it, think about it. Next plan is to, and then we're starting to see the, the um, changing and the breaking of the guard happen at these schools. And, and I, you know, I, I've been trying to figure out how I can be as a theater artist helpful in that process with, with educators. I have seen a lot of my educator friends um, be mistreated at their universities, the, or the, they'll bring me out, and this is at all levels of my career, but they'll bring me out and nobody, uh, you know, the, the, the dean won't show, or their department head won't be there, and, you know, there was no, they, it was, they had to fight to get me there, you know, just things that just feel kind of like you're, you're, you're coming up there in a garbage can lid, you know? <laughs> but you're like, I'll be here because my friend's here, you know? But it's, 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 it's been, um, I used to laugh, but I always, I had this thing, now treat me like you treat Tony Kushner. Mm? <laughs> That's what I, I, I've been saying that since I was probably yeah, too sure. young to, you know, for that to even matter. But then I said that to Tony Kushner, he's like, I don't know if you want that, Dominique. I don't. <laughs> Like, Tony, I can't imagine. I can't, it has to be better, you know what I mean? So, but that's sort of my thing. But I, I would like to see the play, and I'm trying to brainstorm ways in which to get it in dialogue on the ground, and, you know, with people that it, whose truth it reflects. That's actually what I'm trying to do with all of my plays right now. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of it just being like, you know, like, uh, you know, as like museum pieces, you know, I want yeah. them on the ground. I really want to get on the ground. Yeah. Will it be published? Oh, it will be published. It is being published by uh, formerly Sam Prince, now Concord. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I, and I think maybe TCG and I are talking about that too. So yeah, I think it is happening with TCG, yes. Mm -hmm. So many things in my head, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I don't know that for sure, but yeah. Um, yeah. What's that? Wait. Oh. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, uh, Thank you, uh, specifically, because I'm really, really excited for your next piece as a Haitian person myself. So yes, yes, thank you for that. Um, two, I've been thinking a lot about the power of questions. Um, Priya Parker speaks about uh, asking questions to a space is the best way to relinquish power to that space, because you are then opening it up to the space about where the conversation is going to go. So it doesn't centralize around one person holding all the information and gearing that conversation. Um, in your speaks about the canon and how exactly do we start bringing, <laughs> bringing those ancestors, those gods into those spaces. Uh, speaking to my colleagues specifically at predominantly white institutions, I find that the fear isn't necessarily bringing the stories in and having the students read it, but then the questions that are going to come from that. And sometimes my colleagues not feeling like they are equipped and what, it's, what it tends to be, what I tend to hear is just like, um, I don't think I should be the one leading this conversation. And what I hear is this like, I, ha I refuse to do the work to learn about this in order to be engaged in this conversation. And so, just my perspective. Uh, <laughs> um, and so thinking about um, 
the power of uh, your work, specifically being done at like uh, in collegiate environments and such. How, um, what is an offering that you have as an educator for those who are struggling to bring your work into spaces and not necessarily just to bring your work, but just like engaging in conversation, especially to stoke the curiosity of young people who don't see themselves reflected in your plays, but at the same time need to know those stories. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that was clear. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so, maybe. Yeah. I think I understand. It's also like, what is my offering? I'm just gonna kind of repeat it back, but like maybe what, what I'm understanding about your question is, what is my offering to educators who may have that same feeling of imposter syndrome a little bit of like, maybe I shouldn't be the one teaching this or explaining this and that kind of thing, right, you know? And, and I, that's a complicated one. It's kind of like the same thing that kids, young people have felt in the studying, you know, it's like, where's the line, right? Like, we writers, as so many of us writers have had to talk about how, where we stand with higher education and our work in terms of like, do we give this to all the students? Who can play the world and who can learn on the work? You know, like what is the, and how they gonna piss off the other students? And students get real pissed off at each other really fast for things lately. <laughs> they always have, I guess. But you know, um, but you know, it's like how do you, like where's the lines, you know? And I, I think of a few things. One, I think that, that that does mean that you also need to bring, that it is a conversation to broaden who's at your school. That's, that's definitely very important. Um, it is also, I think, to suggest that we as people can't learn from each other is lazy as fuck, you know? <laughs> like, that's just lazy. Like, I've had, to lear I've had to learn the one God that I don't, that's not my religion, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but I can speak the religion fluently, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so I think we, we, we have to stop that and get to know and understand. And there's enough, I mean, for my own work, there's enough for me talking about it for you just to, a whole lesson could be built just letting me talk to myself, you know what I mean? <laughs> just like literally grab sound bites of every, and I'm not the only one, of Katori Hall, of Lynn Nye, we talk so much about our work. We've done a good, good gazillion interviews. One of my most pet peeves is when if somebody asks me something in an interview and I go, now didn't you see that in somebody else's interview? You know, I mean, oh, no. I don't mind the question. No, no, I don't. The, the oh. lady, didn't I say not here? Not here, present company not included. Um, <laughs> But like, because there's, there's ways in which to, especially when they go, so tell me what you do. I'm like, tell me what, I'm not telling you what I do. Now, didn't you know that when you did this interview? But there, because we have to be willing to be curious enough. We have to be curious enough about, if your students bring somebody to you, you might say, hey, I don't know that you can, I used to tell uh, institutions, I even told Lincoln Center, you know, I go, hey, I really like this director and this director, they go, I don't know that work. I said, you get one time to tell me that. Today you don't know their work, fine. The next time I bring this director up, don't tell me that you don't know their work, because that's lazy. It's your job to know the work that's out there. It's your job, you got one job, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a hard job, but it's, you got, that's the job, you know? I can't stand when a casting director says, oh, I don't know them. You're not gonna say it with dismissal. You say it with like, oh, I don't know them. Let me find out. That has to be the, the, the curiosity has to be there. Or you're not, or you're gonna fail people, you know? So it's okay not to know, you know? It's like when you meet, when students meet people and they go, oh, you don't know so-and-so and such and such and such and such. I'm like, okay, well, hold on, let me write it all down. You're you coming at them with a lot, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, none of us is gonna always already know any of everything. That's none of us is gonna know that. But now we can get curious and let your students make you curious, you know? And say, well, where can I, let me find out where I can find some of this person's work. Let me get to know that, okay. Guys, I think I would like to bring something to me that you would like to learn, because you're paying, they're paying for the education, yeah. you know? They got to be able to get something that they're paying for, you know, to be able to learn about themselves. So I say, who do you want to learn about? We can all gonna have to learn about that, that writer then, mm -hmm. you know? I just would like to see that kind of inclusion happening, um, so that you can't just say, oh, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not the right one, and thus, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just bow out of this, yeah. engaging with this whole thing. I would say maybe not that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, thank you for this wonderful event. My name is Daryl Alejandro Holness. I'm with the Latinx Playwright Circle. Thank you for what you said earlier today, um, advocating for the need for more Latinx plays to be part of the American literary landscape. We really appreciate it. My question is, um, I think that you're a terrific arts advocate. I have several friends that 
made their Broadway debut as playwrights. I have several friends and acquaintances and colleagues that are the first black something in their department, the first Latina something in the department, their first Asian American something in the department. And I was just wondering if you had any advice about what it means to become an advocate and what it means to have your work rise to a level where you're placed in a, in a spotlight, where you now have to advocate or are asked to advocate for a community, for an industry, right? And how you've sort of grown into the great advocate that you are now. Um, that's a, yeah. And, and are you meaning advocate for inside of theater itself? Or I think I want to make sure I understand the question. Like, an advocate for others inside of the theater continuum, or an advocate for communities inside of the work. I'm just making sure I understand which one. You know? I'm thinking of the kind of stages that you're on right now, where folks are asking you questions about uh, black women in theater. Gotcha. Folks are asking you questions about, you know, yeah. community and advocacy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, um, so I recognize that I am not in this continuum by myself. I never have been, I never will be and that I am always here on the shoulders of the people that not only came before me, but that are like practicing right here with me and that are like studying me or studying someone adjacent to me, right? Um, that none of us is in this ecosystem by ourselves. And then I also want to say, I also recognize that I think some people might get dis, artists may get disconnected from like educators, you know? Because it seems like education is its own field and the practice of the art is like it's, a, it's another club and its own thing. But to me, the, the scholarship around the art is the only way that the art is going to be like preserved, you know. And so there can't be this disconnect, you know, between education and like with the practice of it that's actually happening in the field, right? Um, okay, so I say all that to say that's that's my headspace for that. So when I approach advocacy, um, and I approach it in a very, I have a, whole, I have a bunch of different. I keep touching, it's like I feel. <laughs> this mic is where I want to be with my hand. <laughs> um, but when I, when I approach uh, what advocacy looks like to me, it is, it, is, it is, I don't think that I alone have the answer or the voice or that I am the one, right? I'm not no chosen one that can thus, you know, I'm not Moses, you know? However, I can, um, but I can make impact with what I say, how I say, how I show up on a stage, how I stand in my truth, and how and what and who I see out there doing that I'm doing work with and who I who I don't see. And I have to be able to name all those things, right? I think to be able to like make space for other black women writers, for instance, black women with an X, you know. Like to be able to make space for um, them is to once take up space, you know, and 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 open that door and then leave it open. Right to be able to ask questions to the institutions that I'm at, um, to check for, but also to to mentor, you know, to be able to reach out to to have people who reach out to me and me make myself available to them. Right. So those are the ways, in small ways of advocacy. I think in larger, like social justice advocacy, that's happening. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I want to learn the things that I am pushing to change. Right. So I, I feel like I can't like stand on the outside of an institution and say, this needs to change. I have no idea how the hell the thing is run. I don't know yeah. what I'm asking for specifically. I don't even really know exactly what I'm asking for. For instance, I know people have often said, you know, about Broadway, they have so many things that they want to have changed on Broadway. I'm like, do you know who runs Broadway? Because if you don't know who runs Broadway, you're gonna, the things you're asking for, you're starting like here, you know? You're not starting here, you know what I mean? It's like trying to go after a drug and you're going like to the corner boys. You're not gonna stop the drug game with the corner boy, you're going to the <laughs> lowest person, the lowest denominator in this game, you know? And so I, with Broadway, I go, if you're not, if you don't, first of all, understand that Broadway is a real estate game, then you're already not understanding Broadway, you know? Broadway is streets and buildings more than it is Good work is gonna make its way, you know. It's not. That's not. Has nothing to do with Broadway, you know. Maybe for a few not-for-profit, you know, um, theater companies who are on Broadway, but for the commercial engine that is Broadway, if we don't like, we I feel like there's just a, a, a education we don't have to even be fighting. I want to. I want accurate fighting, you know. I want you to know where that button is inside that building that you're trying to detonate. <laughs> you know, don't be just 
sloppily, <laughs> you know, yeah. knocking down stuff. I mean, sure, I guess sloppily knocking down stuff works. You might eventually find a button or just get rid of everything and the button itself, too. <laughs> <laughs> but you might, you might have just been able to take, hit the button <laughs> and do a few of those things for yourself, you know. So for me, I like to um, understand uh, the, the, the every side of the table that I'm coming for, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I ask questions to producers. I say, I want to understand their thinking in the producer world and the commercial producing world. And I'm on the board of Signature Theater. I'm, you know, I was on the board, founding member of the Detroit Public Theater. You know, like I want to know, I want to know to donors, how are you giving money to board members? What's making you stay on this board? Like, where's your mind at? Because I know if if you're not, if you're, if your mind is about doing things one way and somebody here can't hit you at that level, yeah. then the artist is gonna get out here and get on that stage and be your victim, <laughs> you know? And so I, I, I think it's about um, having a, a knowledge, a really vast knowledge of how this whole field works, trying my hand, doing some things myself, you know? Because if it all burns to hell, I can build it, like, I can build it myself. And being Haitian, I will say this, during the pandemic, I thought, um, so many people, you know, were like, what do you think of theater? What's going to happen? What's the fate? I was like, well, I think theater is going to feel, really understand that it's made a big mistake in not going after these young people and not making more space for young, younger folks to be able to have affordability to get tickets to the theater and not censoring them in the marketing and like not making more space for them because the first people back from this pandemic are going to be young people. <laughs> They're the ones going to go places without masks, you know, while the rest of us like, you know, like they'll be the ones that are more resilient out here and they're going to be the ones coming back and they're and they not going to come back to us. They're going to go back to everything else, you know. So to me, I think you have to cultivate the, the you have to get back on the ground and cultivate from the ground up. And so I say this about being Haitian because when the earthquake happened to Haiti, if you ever watch Raul Peck's documentary, um, Fatal Assistance, which is sort of one of the sources to my, not my new play, Bad Creole. It's looking at the relationship between Haiti and the U.S. Um, in times of, and what, uh, what government assistance has looked like to Haiti, you know. Um, but I, there was a Haitian who spoke, a Haitian man standing in the rubble of his home. And this is like my whole metaphor for 2020. <laughs> a man was standing in the rubble of his home. And the filmmaker asked him, you know, is he upset? Is he like really, really angry? You know, what is, how, is, how is he feeling right now? He's like, angry? How, I cannot be angry. How can I be angry at God's will? How can I be angry? This happened. What is there to be angry about? And then the guy, well, I mean, you're standing in the rubble of your home. And this was an elder, older Haitian man. And he looked dead at the camera and he says, oh, I'm not afraid to start over. And that was my whole 2020. I was like, okay. Well, the, the elder told me, so there it is. I'm not, I'm not afraid to stand in the rubble and say, I can build this again. Mm -hmm. And I can build it better. You know? And so for me, in our field, I think we have to, we're so afraid of it going to rubble mm -hmm. that we will keep some very corrupt rubble, you know, some very corrupt bricks. And, and we'll hold on to them corrupt bricks. It's like, we don't want it to be rubble, though. I'm like, why can't it be rubble? Mm -hmm. Get some better bricks. Build yeah. the whole thing up. And no, people think that they're, when they think of like destroy, they think that that's where it stops. No, destroy, rebuild, rebuild. Everybody out here that's maybe having, everybody has different points of view of how to, to address and how to be an advocate and how mm -hmm. to fight for social justice. And they're all right. The answer is, if you're fighting for it, no matter what your way is, it's all right. It might not be someone else's strategy, but if that's your goal, then you're going to get it, right? But to me, it's don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of standing in rubble, you know? Um, yeah. conversation has come to a close. Please join me again in thanking Dominique Marisa for thank being you, here in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um,